Thank you, Mark. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues from across the world, let me first thank Dr. Hadley for that warm and wonderful introduction. For those of you who have the opportunity to know uh, Mark on a more personal basis, he's truly one of the special people in all of neurosurgery. Well, over the last decade, I've had the privilege of serving on the Executive Committee of the Congress and have learned much from the leadership, voluntary efforts, and spirit of Bill Friedman, Hunt Bacher, Dan Barrow, Isam Awad, Steve Papadopoulos, Mark Hadley, Vince Trainalis, Nelson Oyashiku, and Richard Ellenbogen, a bunch of guys who kept me around. The Congress of Neurological Surgeons has a legacy of innovation, a mission of education, and concern with global issues of neurosurgery since 1951. To serve the organization is a privilege for which I must thank my wife Susan, our sons Alex and Max, and our parents and friends who have traveled to be with us here today. My time away and crazy ideas are all a result of their support and the support of my wife. Although my parents provided the foundation, she makes it happen. I thank my friends and colleagues at the University of Toronto, where I studied and trained, and the University of Pittsburgh, where I found a home. This year's CNS Executive Committee is the heart of the organization and the reason that we are here today. But I must warn you, as you may have already guessed, I speak a dialect slightly different from traditional American, and occasional Canadian words may show up in this address, so please beware. Well, the theme of today's address is breaking through the ice of neurosurgery. And to address this topic, I will use two of my own personal interests, contrarian thinking and polar exploration. There's two opposite things right off the bat. To critically evaluate what we do and who we are as neurosurgeons. So how shall we break through the barriers, and there are many, that limit progress? Do we dare explore neurosurgery as the great explorers of world history tackled their challenges? We have been given a gift, this neurosurgery, but a gift that is riddled with conflict, frequent change, redefinition, and a tide of progress that may not flow with how we've been trained. And across the span of a career, over 30 years, much will happen. Last year at this meeting, the director and producer, George Lucas, spoke on the topic of creativity, and he's challenged us to ask about the status quo, question authority, innovate, which of course sometimes may go in the wrong direction. There are many things in neurosurgery that are difficult, and sometimes we find an easier way to do things, but frequently we just put up with our own difficulties. So if we are radically going to change neurosurgery, not just eventually for the better, but quickly, not in the next generation's time, but in our time, which will be so much more fun, we will have to evaluate how we think and how we address new ideas and tackle problems. Do we change because we have the courage to change or because it leads to professional career advancement? For some neurosurgeons, the current solution may be, at, may be just adequate, and they may, they, they may not desire a better way. Tom Starzl at the University of Pittsburgh radically changed the culture of organ transplantation so that what was deemed crazy several decades, decades ago is now mainstream. The problem is not that it won't work, it's that we have an organ shortage, a medical problem replaced by a societal problem. Of course, the public wants to know what, what we are doing about their problems. For example, on the topic of cellular repair, if rats are getting better, then why not people? And of course, our answer might be complex about stem cell research and so on, but the important question is, why not? Tremendous advances in neuromodulation, both for the brain and peripheral nervous system, are happening every year. An image in the upper right was created to be funny, but recent research five months ago showed that the insular cortex may be important for addiction. We are identifying the anatomy of depression and OCD, as well as other illnesses, and transcutaneous stimulation in this picture is now a neurosurgical craniotomy reality. Even the concept of reversing the vegetative state is now being addressed with neuromodulation. Can we even envision an era where neuroimaging shows us the anatomy of intense romantic love? Now there would be a target and a great business. And might an electrode be placed there someday? Certainly the greatest challenges to both neurosurgery and those in other realms will require not just a revamping of old thinking, but new thinking. Significant problems. Meetings such as these must just not update what we do or tinker with what we already know, but provide us with new avenues for thought. World-renowned oceanographer Robert Ballard, who will speak tomorrow, has chronicled the cycle of exploration beginning with a vision, preparation, the journey, overcoming the obstacles, 
which frequently include the inaccurate conventional wisdom that surrounds us, discovering the truth, and fostering new vision. General Patton said that if everyone is thinking the same thing, then no one is thinking. Can we look at neurosurgical data and draw contrarian conclusions? After decades of trying to preserve hearing with acoustic neuroma resection and achieving a success rate of 15 to 30 percent or so, is the answer just simply, it's impossible. So let's just do the translabyrinthine approach. Or we need to try harder. Or is it to try something else? In the business world, that success rate would be considered an abject failure. The company would have been sold a long time ago. So contrarian thinking is all around us, affecting both society and neurosurgery. The television, for example. Initially, it was enough that the TV was an entertaining but passive environment. But change created an active environment. Is this what the television was created for? Sitting on the couch? It seemed to be quite adequate for decades. Or was it this? Remember when, up in the right, this amazing invention that you could suddenly do something with your television set, playing Pong. Within 20 years, we now have World of Warcraft. Over 9 million players worldwide. Tremendous graphics, virtual reality, and what seems to be a game without an end. The Nintendo Wii system gets people off the couch. When this paradigm shift occurred for the television screen, there was rapid acceptance. So how quickly do we accept change? In the world of personal audio, people seem to be quite happy with the transistor radio. But when the Walkman was created, carrying around your own songs was revolutionary. When the concept was digital, there was rapid change. When I was a teenager, I was proud that I had hundreds of albums. Now that concept is considered ridiculous. People do not need hundreds of albums. They need access to every song ever written. This, this level of access is now even provided for our own journal. Although, as you can see, change is not for everyone. In neurosurgery, we are faced with conflicting concepts all the time. Do we fuse the spine or do we preserve motion? Both were contrarian to each other, and yet they disagree. I always like this journal cover. Is the brain really below the spinal cord? That would be a novel thought. When we look at our own clinical outcomes, what is our goal? Does our care need to be perfect, just OK, generic so that we can do it for everybody, or just dependent upon disease? Should surgical outcomes be generic? Should we have Tylenol for acoustic neuromas like we have Tylenol for a fever? It works the same no matter where you are. Would this be an acceptable goal for neurosurgery, but it lies in contrast to the concept of the master surgeon? The master surgeon concept is fostered in residency as a goal for individual trainees. We train people to do everything, but what actually happens in practice? Do they, in fact, do everything? If we were to plot the global scale of neurosurgeons to provide worldwide care and how that changes over time, where would we be on this curve if more procedures were generic? Would we actually get worse, or would we progress to the mean? Well, after 100 years of neurosurgery, as we look back, we are indeed improving, and we certainly know where there's been gains made. But what about the velocity, and what about the expectations of patients? In the world of personal finance, we are told to sell stocks when others are buying and buy when others are selling. But how many people actually do this? If we are to truly make real progress, and again quickly, we will need change in our thinking. For example, remove the plaque or push it out of the way? Should we look at an aneurysm from the inside or from the outside? Should we leave the tumor in or should we take it out? Should we fuse the motion segment or should we preserve it? Even if you look at the concept of the transition, the deadly transition from a benign to a malignant meningioma, often identified with multiple resections. It was benign here, but, that, but that the third time I operated on it was cancer. Why does that happen? You may believe that, well, it's just a bad disease. But is that true? We know that other things cause cancer, radiation, heat, inflammation, infection. From a contrarian perspective, was it our surgery that actually caused cancer? Is that possible? We know that cancer can be a bent repair of injury. Could the cautery, could we, the observer of the event, be the cause? Certainly, we have many individuals in neurosurgery with a passion for asking the difficult questions, beginning with Cushing and the achievements of so many across the specialty. And as we look forward in an era of evidence-based medicine, we have many fine leaders, and many others not listed, who have developed their careers in this way. So if we want to rapidly improve neurosurgery, we, we should start with an evaluation of its definition. 
We could look up the American board definition, but I would propose that neurosurgery is what each of you thinks it is, or perhaps what each of you does. Is it static, passive, active, visionary, reactionary? I would submit that the neurosurgeon is a, simply an explorer and that our practice requires us to constantly break the ice. I've had a long-standing interest in polar exploration and would like to evaluate neurosurgery in its first hundred years to the hundred years that came before it, a hundred years of polar exploration. In 1907, a hundred years ago, Cushing was at his desk writing the pituitary body and at the same time Peary was sailing towards the North Pole. This glow from my home shows the Arctic regions as we know it now, but at the beginning of the 19th century, this area was void, just as neurosurgery was an open slate at the start of the 20th century. So if neurosurgeons are explorers, then what is exploration? Is it doing something risky or something not done before? Something that increases understanding because it is there like a mountain? Exploration is the directed pursuit of knowledge in an area where little is known. Andres Lozano and John Gervin, two great explorers in Arctic garb. Modern polar exploration ended in 1920. It's over in the era of the airplane. 66 years later, there was a modified airplane that landed on the moon. As the neurosurgical story begins with Cushing and McEwen and others, the polar story starts with Alexander Mackenzie, the first Caucasian to map an overland route to the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. This book spurred Thomas Jefferson to create the Lewis and Clark expedition. Well, what does an explorer look like? Well, we all know what Dr. Roten looks like. But here is Ernest Shackleton wearing his Burberry cloth in the Antarctic regions. Both the polar world and neurosurgery offer some of the most extreme environments on the planet. Perhaps these are the axons of polar exploration. There were two goals at the time. One was to discover a northwest passage from Europe to Asia so that travel did not have to circumvent South America, and the other was to get to the North Pole. The first century of neurosurgery had two main goals. One was to operate on disease safely and with benefit, and one was to learn about the function of the nervous system. It's still unclear what will be our, what will be our airplane, that transforming technologic paradigm that will radically change the entire approach to what we do. So over these 200-year eras, what did explorers learn along the way? And was, there, was their learning fast or slow? What can we learn from this? How did people respond to these challenges? Now in the polar world, some of the lessons may seem somewhat pedestrian. In fact, it took 60 years to simply figure out that the Arctic Ocean was frozen solid. For many, the concept existed of an open polar sea. Now this concept was supported by an American physician, Isaac Hayes, and by many others, who thought that the further north you went, the ice would eventually break up due to the warming rays of the sun, and it would be clear sailing all the way to the pole. Of course, this was 60 years of silliness, and many died because of it. Explor explorers learned not so quick quickly that some problems could not simply be overcome by an increasing manpower and just trying harder. Here on the Shackleton expedition, after the endurance was stuck in the ice, you can see that it would not have mattered if there were a million men with pickaxes out there. This was a hopeless problem. Indeed, the biggest problem in polar exploration was the ice. And even this oversized jiggly saw was not the solution. The Antarctic coast was still hundreds of miles away. Where did these people really think they were going? Interestingly, there may be some value in being stuck in an investigation. That is the value of serendipity. Eventually we learned something. When John Ross was stuck on the ice for five years, and of course nobody knew where he was as there was no way to communicate, he and his officers eventually got off the ship, walked around, and discovered the North Magnetic Pole. The solution to the ice problem took 130 years. It was not to break up the ice or to create stronger ships or more powerful engines. For over a century, all the technology in the world was useless. The problem of the ice was its own solution. A device was developed that would simply land on the ice. Now explorers did not want water. They wanted ice. In fact, even now, when one flies to the pole, oil and gasoline drums are placed at locations for which a plane must land and refuel. The solution was contrarian. Now explorers also learned that fur rather than wool provided better clothing in the Arctic. Might seem obvious, but it took 70 years to figure out. I mean, why would a European explorer want to dress like this man? It was considered savage. The whole point was to change him, not to be like him. 
After 60 years of polar exploration, it was a bored Cincinnati newsman turned Arctic explorer Charles Francis Hall, who was the first to live among the Eskimos, dress like an Eskimo, eat like an Eskimo, and under his leadership set the, the record for the furthest north exploration of the time. In fact, he got so far north that his men were scared they would never return, mutinied, and poisoned him with arsenic. So although fur was better, his life ends as a tragic figure. It took 70 years for fur, and it took 70 years for us to get better lighting with the microscope. It takes time. Well, explorers also learned that something in fresh meat and vegetables prevented the deadly disease of scurvy. For many decades, clean living alone was thought the way to present this disease. Interestingly, the savage Eskimos rarely got scurvy, but of course their diet was considered unacceptable. This seminal problem took 200 years to figure out. Of course, all someone had to do was watch what the Eskimos were eating and notice that they never got scurvy. This unacceptable Inuit diet allowed them to do incredible things in a hostile environment. But the explorer watching this, despite the envy and interest in the technique, did not draw the logical conclusion that the person doing it was healthy. Why was their mind so closed? When John Franklin was first sent to the Northwest Passage in 1819 with the help of French voyagers, the result was starvation, murder, and cannibalism. One of his lieutenants, John Richardson, managed this problem and served as judge, jury, and executioner over the murder of a voyager who had killed one of the officers and brought forth the meat, claiming it was from a wolf that he had killed. However, when they came back and did the redo operation, a thousand new miles of Arctic coastline was charted. Both were knighted. They had figured out what to eat. And when that happens, the map of the Arctic begins to fill in. Based on that success, Franklin was sent 20 years later to solve the final puzzle of the Northwest Passage on an expedition at the time, technologically at the level of our initial voyages to the moon. However, without communication and with events that remained unsolved for over a century, he was lost. The British, French, and eventually Americans went to search for him. Alicia Kent Kane, another American physician with aspirations of finding the pole, wrote this book, which became the second best selling book in the United States during the Civil War, second only to the Bible. Other Franklin search expeditions, rarely successful in finding clues, mapped out increasingly more Arctic geography. However, the people who know, knew more about the Arctic than anyone, the whalers, were rarely asked for their opinion. I mean, how often do we ask for advice from those on the outskirts of our own field in our evolving world? Franklin's wife, in desperation, befriended one of the great whalers, William Scoresby, asking for help to find her husband. And when remains and letters of the expedition were found by McClintock, the fate was known, but the reason for failure was unclear. Do we often know why our properly performed operation has a negative outcome? It was not until a book published just seven years ago, digging deep into the records, that the cause was found. And of course, it was food. The meals were being prepared in canisters too big to allow heat to adequately penetrate and cook the contents. And botulism and lead poisoning were the results. Explorers like neurosurgeons travel on their stomachs. Stephenson, the great explorer of the early 20th century who mapped most of the northerly, northerly Arctic islands, truly learned how to live in this hostile region and was known to come out of the Arctic after a six-month period actually having gained weight. Well, another lesson that was eventually learned was that dogs should pull sleds and not men. Although we might think that this is obvious, it took 95 years to figure out. When Perry was sent to sled to the North Pole from the islands north of Norway in 1827, 12 men were asked to pull sleds, each weighing 3,700 pounds. In two months, they turned around. The British finally gave up on their attempts to reach the pole in 1876, still having men pull sleds. Interestingly, the savages around them seemed to glide over the ice with an alternative source of energy to solve their transportation problems. They moved with efficiency and power. In neurosurgery, it similarly took 95 years for an alternative energy concept, radiation rather than mechanical surgical energy, to become acceptable to tackle some of the complex problems of the nervous system. And yet in the earlier years, it was also considered somewhat unmanly. Without a transforming concept, you can see that progress moves slowly. Over the last four decades, despite the tremendous efforts of many, we have, we have improved the average survival of glioblastoma patients by only six months. That's one month of progress every seven years. A similar graph shows the rate of progress made over a century in trying to get to the top of the world from 80 to 90 degrees latitude. 
And without a radical new concept, progress just simply takes too long. In the search for the elusive Northwest Passage, explorers eventually learned that there was no practical route to China through the Arctic. And of course, the usual comment at the time was that, well, there must be. It took 75 years to figure out that just bullheadedness was incorrect. Now, it might seem obvious to you that a good backup plan would be something important in an investigation. And it was typically something like, well, if you don't come back, we'll send somebody out to look for you, although we don't really know where you are. The concept of the backup plan was never really figured out. Well, you might think it's important to learn the language of the people being explored. For example, what could these people possibly tell an American or European explorer? And although there was some attempt to learn their language over 30 years, it was never really a priority. What is the language of brain function that we study? The voice of the brain, such as these cells in the subthalamic nucleus, have much to tell us. How few of us actually study cortical mapping or recordings of brain cells or fibers? I would submit that this may be the key to the discovery of the major technologic change that transforms our specialty. We also know that the language of publication, our language, is limiting. Why do we focus solely on English when so many of the minds of the world do not understand this language? For this reason, and to show it could be done, we have the abstracts of the current issue of neurosurgery translated into Japanese, as well as a hybrid Japanese-English cover. I mean, there are 4,000 neurosurgeons in Japan. Nansen, the famed Norwegian explorer, the first person to ski across Greenland and to set the furthest north record, was a neurobiologist first, and his PhD thesis described the concept of a neuron even before Ramon E. Cajal. Unfortunately, his work was published in Norwegian, so of course, who read it? Fortunately, Nansen later won a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize, for creating the concept of refugee status. Explorers learned that publication of results, therefore, was crucial. We all know the adage, either publish or perish. This was certainly true. You can see the endurance perishing as Shackleton watched. Indeed, this was the classic example of pay for performance. The only money an explorer ever saw, other than his small government wage, was after his book publication. This is a sales tag from one of my Franklin books for four, four pounds, four shillings. So how do we, the neurosurgical explorers, publish? Well, we have journals and textbooks, but who actually does the writing? What proportion of the world's neuroscience minds are contributing to our total knowledge base? How long does this take? Does everyone have access to it? For example, these are two excellent textbooks, but both have a limited number of authors. They took years to create and years to update. Many minds now use alternative sources of information, such as this one, Wikipedia. It's an online, current, inter interactive, global encyclopedia. It contains almost two million articles in the English language and countless others in other languages. Why not have Wikipedia in Japanese? For that reason, earlier this year, we began the CNS Wiki project entitled NeuroWiki. We have created a global, current, interactive information environment open to the contributions of any interested party with some important scientific controls. There are already 1,200 entries, and we have not even launched it yet for general use. Today, we will do so. You can go to the NeuroWiki at the CNS homepage and participate in this new concept of neurosurgical education. Our goal is not only to tap into a limited subset of contributors, but into the brightest minds in neuroscience. Move, move that slide ahead, please. The brightest minds in neuroscience, but not only North American neuroscience, but in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, the minds down under, the global neuroscience community. We should have information for us and for our patients from any computer. Neurosurgery needs to be responsive immediately to both threats from other rapidly disseminated media sources and to make our opinions known broadly and in a timely fashion. At present, yes, the presidents of the CNS and NNS can write letters like this one to the editor of JAMA, hoping that they publish our comments. And such a format is important, but we need to be better and we need to be faster. But what about cost? Explorers learned that a big expensive approach yielded impressive results, but it was often the work of an individual or small group that achieved more. Amundsen, the great Norwegian explorer, who was the first to sail through the Northwest Passage, get to the South Pole and fly to the North Pole, of course here wearing fur, did something else that was special. 
He never brought a doctor on any of his expeditions. Having other intelligent minds around often led to more problems than they were really worth. So we know that it's often the investigations of a small group, maybe it's your practice in your town, not in a university, nimble and innovative that yield the most impressive results, gliding across the terrain in question poised for discovery, focused on keen observation. Asking the right questions was something eventually learned over eight decades in the Arctic. In 1883, the first International Polar Year was dedicated to ask questions. Similarly, neurosurgery, after a century, has finally entered an era, somewhat reluctantly, of evidence-based medicine. By coincidence, the fourth International Polar Year is this year, 2007. Well, how many of our procedures have lofty goals but otherwise gain little? Every operation we do is an opportunity to learn something new, to share our discovery with others through some form of data collection. But 99% of our surgical observations are never used for anything. That culture will have to change as we begin a systematic study of our individual outcomes. Each of you will be empowered by your own and shared data. When Franklin was told to go to the poll in 1818, the directions were somewhat similar to telling a neurosurgery resident to completely remove the glioblastoma, do it with no deficits, and make sure it never comes back. It was almost ridiculous. The North Pole was eventually reached a century later by Robert Peary, and during the same year, success was also claimed by another New York physician, Frederick Cook. These claims were the most well-known media stories of that era, Peary being backed by the New York Times and Cook being backed by the New York Herald. Their claims to being the first to place the American flag over the pole. I thought the North Pole was in Canada, by the way, but that's a separate topic. But this led to vicious attacks about each other, about their wives and family in the media. That artist's rendering, in fact, showed that they're surrounded by penguins. And of course, there are no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, the end of polar exploration, as I mentioned, ends with air flight, and before the airplane, the hot air balloon. The hope with, with this concept was that the wind would blow you towards the pole, and then magically the wind direction would suddenly change and, and bring you home again. What I call the Wizard of Oz approach to polar exploration, as you can see in this image. By, by the way, was the, was the Tin Man actually a neurosurgeon? I've always wondered about this one. Later, Amundsen reached the pole by Zeppelin. And as we know, air flight ended the golden era of Arctic exploration. We all are the explorers of the golden era of neurosurgery. So yes, neurosurgeons can stand in the face of a challenge, whether it is the insula or an iceberg. We can illuminate the deep recesses of the brain with a microscope, an endoscope, and next, the vasculoscope, as we can explore lands where the sun never sets. We can come close to the great perils of nature and neuroscience. And we do have colleagues who can help us deal with those perils. We can go boldly into the uncharted territories and develop new methods for guiding our travels, such as this map of one of Saturn's moons, from the airplane to Saturn's moons. The world will indeed gain much from the discoveries of neurosurgeons. If we dare to dream, dare to question, dare to create, dare to prove yourself correct, dare to change the world, and dare to change the world of neurosurgery. The human brain, spinal cord, nerves, and their coverings are a beautiful landscape of difficult challenges, and yet when the sun is shining, this hostile environment can be ours for the taking. Thank you very much.